love of Jesus. Our theme this morning will be Paul elevates thought in the things he taught. And we're going to be looking at what it means to be a Christian and to be embraced by the love of God. Let's turn in our Bible for our scripture reading to the first chapter of Romans. Romans chapter 1, and uh, today we will read from the first verse down to verse 12. Our thoughts will be focused on verses 6 and 7. So as we read through, you might like to pay particular attention to those two verses, verses 6 and 7. But we begin to read at verse 1 through to verse 12. Paul, a born servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if, by some means, now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 11, knowing that once again the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now before we turn our thoughts to meditate upon this passage, let's take a moment again for prayer. Let's all pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we continue to lift our voice and heart in thanksgiving and praise again today. As we rejoice in your faithfulness throughout another week that's passed. You have reminded us so often in your word that you never leave us, nor do you forsake us. And even though we have been surrounded by so much uncertainty and fear, yet we have been sustained by your grace. We come to you again this day, mindful that your word has been given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a revelation of God and the things of God. And we are therefore privileged to spend a little time again this morning in meditation upon its truth. We recognize, however, that we need to be taught by God today in order for the word to accomplish in our hearts and lives the purpose of your divine intention. And so we ask that you will make us a willing people in this the day of your power, 
touching our minds so that we are being confirmed and conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus. So that as the word is heard, it will so penetrate our heart that we will become doers of it. Shape and mold and fashion our lives according to your will, so that we may be presentable to a lost world as those who are vessels of honor, sanctified and fit for the Master's use. We pray for the enlightenment of your spirit as we meditate upon the scriptures today. May none be seen save Jesus only as our minds are brought into submission to your will. Be with those unable to be present today, those who are not well, those who are struggling through this pandemic, those who are concerned about the future, those who perhaps are facing a degree of uncertainty. We pray that in whatever circumstance they are, you will draw near to strengthen and encourage them. Touch those who are not well. Restore a measure of good health to them. To those whose minds are in turmoil, Bring peace and serenity and calm as their mind is stayed upon you. Bring, we pray, into our hearts the quiet confidence of your presence so that whether we are going through good times or difficult, we will learn to trust in the Lord and to cast our burdens upon the Lord, knowing that you care for us. To this end, Father, we now commit to you this time of worship and pray that by your Spirit you will enlighten our minds, encourage our hearts, and enable us to glorify you in all things. This we pray in our Saviour's name, and for his sake. Amen. Amen. For a little time this morning, we want to return to the first chapter of Romans, and in particular, take as our focus for today, verse 6 and 7, where the Apostle Paul is now uh, addressing the hearers or the readers of this letter in particular. And as we have already noted, uh, he has set out three areas to uh, um, uh, imply and impart and, and enforce to a degree his own right to be addressing them in this fashion and to be expecting them to learn from the message that he brings by indicating the three aspects of his own credentials. His servitude, um, born servant of Jesus, verse 1, his separation to the gospel, verse 1, and then he is concentrated on his Savior in verses 2 through to verse 6. And you'll notice that verse 6 becomes a kind of transition uh, in the thought process of Paul. He will begin in verse 7 to introduce what uh, become, uh, in a sense, the link between his own position and his own credentials and his own experience and relationship with God. And he will now begin to focus on the Roman believers. So verse 6 becomes that kind of pivotal connection. And you'll see that he does that by simply stating, among whom you also are the called 
of Jesus Christ. So that now places a new emphasis. He is now drawing them, as it were, into the focus of his uh, message to them. And then he, in verse 7, identifies, if you like, two aspects of particular truth that he feels they must embrace in order for the remainder of his letter to have any impression or impact or benefit to them. And so in verse 7, he simply addresses them to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. And then he gives the normal salutation, which we will come back to, God willing, next Lord's Day. But as he sets out for them what virtually becomes the identifying of their spiritual status, he names three important links or three pivotal points in our understanding of why we are here, what God's purpose is for our lives, and how we can effectively unveil to a lost world the impetus of what God is doing in our hearts and lives. Now, we, we need to understand right from the beginning, in a sense, that as Christians, we are not called upon to impose upon anyone else what we see or feel to be the conforming nature of our relationship with God. We cannot present ourselves as an example of a good believer. We may try our best to be that, but that is not the purpose of our witness. The purpose of our witness is to both by lip and by life to convey the true meaning of what a Christian really is. In other words, we have to show it, to demonstrate it, as well as to record it. Now, the only way we can successfully do that is by having a vibrant relationship with God in and through Christ, who in turn then makes known or reveals himself through us to others. So that in essence, the witness is not our witness, but it is the witness of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. Now, this is the aspect of truth that the Apostle Paul wants to convey to the believers at Rome. And so you'll note that he begins uh, by elevating their thoughts. He will get into the issues that they are confronting in the city of Rome, and he will do that quite graphically as we go through the latter part of the chapter. But at this point, he is not wanting to address the issues that they are confronting or even the problems that are internal as well as external. He will do all of that eventually through the letter. But what he wants to do is to make sure that they are standing on firm ground. They are fully committed to the knowledge of what they are as the people of God. And then in turn, from that knowledge comes assurance. As with that assurance comes the power that enables them to live and to present as the people of God. Uh, you'll, you'll note that what Paul is doing is he is drawing us towards verse 15 and 16, where he develops this theme about the gospel, and he tells us it is the power of God unto salvation. And the emphasis there is on the it is. It is the power of God unto 
salvation. Not you, not me, not the believers in Rome. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. So if we're not sharing the gospel, if we're not living the gospel, then there will be no power in our lives to be a, an effective witness for him. So Paul is establishing this rule, as it were, for our behavior, which begins not with us in the practical sense of our labors here, but begins with our understanding of and appreciation of in the application of what God has performed within our hearts and lives. And so he sets out in verse 6 and 7 three of these areas that outline the spiritual status of all who believe. So in verse 6 we read, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now remember that this is a general letter. And uh, being that, there is an application not only for those who are in Rome, but for those who are in Ride or Eastwood or Chatswood or, or wherever we may be. This is a, a call, a, a call to rethink and reestablish our understanding of what we are as the people of God, wherever we may be, because we're all included in this comment. So Paul reminds us of three things. In verse 6, you'll note the words, among whom you also are, and here is the, the comment, the called of Jesus Christ. Now we've already noted the importance of the little phrase, the called. So we're not just looking at those who are called, but those who are the called. That makes it very important, and we'll, we'll come to develop that in a moment. So the first thought is uh, in relation to their predestination. Now that's a Bible word. And, and we need to have an understanding of what that means and how it relates to us. And we'll do that in just a moment. Then, coming into verse 7, he makes two further statements. And these statements become the expression, or if you like, the explanation of what is essentially our position as outlined in verse 6. So, our position is we are the called of God. The question is, how did we find ourselves in that position? How do we get into that position? What do we do in order to be established in that position where we know that we are the called of Jesus Christ? Well, there are two things. Verse 7. To all who are in Rome, here's the first one, beloved of God. That reveals their preservation. They are beloved of God. We often quote that little text, we are being kept by the power of of God. What is the power of God? It's the power of love. We'll see more of that in a moment. Then we come down to verse 7, the second part. Called to be saints. That is their presentation. See, that's how we live our lives. So, before we even get to the practical nature of our calling, we need to be established in our mind of these other two elements. One is the fact that we are the called of Jesus Christ. And secondly, we are beloved of God. And when we have an understanding of that, 
and feel the reality of that, then we are able to fulfill the third, which is called to be saints. And I'm using that expression. Those who uh, have been through the first service, you've already got the handle on, on what we're going to be saying about that. So you've got to keep quiet until you get to that, that point. But these are, the, these are the, the instructions that Paul is now giving. So having shared his own testimony in the opening verses, Paul is now identifying with how these apply in the lives of those to whom he is writing. So we're going to just take these three thoughts and for a few moments break them down in order to gain that uh, fresh appreciation for what it means to be a Christian. So here come the identifying features of every child of God. Verse 6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Here once again the Apostle Paul is confirming what becomes the main thrust of his letter, the gospel. He is telling us what the gospel is. He is telling us what the gospel does. He is telling us how the gospel is effectually at work in our hearts. The gospel is all about Jesus. And the gospel, as it goes out in proclamation, draws sinners to Jesus. We are the called. And this calling or this work of the gospel is a work of God right from beginning to end. It is essentially a work of God. Take your Bible over to the second chapter of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, let's just take a, a little look at verses 1 through to 5. And you'll note that the Apostle Paul is addressing the saints. And he uses that term in verse 1 of chapter 1, to the saints who are in Ephesus. So when he writes here in chapter 2, verse 1, and you, he is specifically identifying true believers those who are in the family of God, those who are in the enjoyment of God's grace, his saving grace. So he writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then he describes in verse 2 and 3 what that meant to be in your sins, what it meant to be dead in sins. And then he comes in in verse 4 to continue his thought. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Now remember, he is still writing to the saints. So he is not addressing here the general nature of the love of God. God so loved the world. That's not the aspect of love that he is referring to here. This is a specific love applied in a specific way for a specific purpose. But God, who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Not everyone will be saved. Not everyone will be raised from the deadness of their sin. But God has specifically applied his saving love and grace and mercy to those who are to be saints. Now, what uh, does this mean, in essence? We'll come through to John's Gospel, 
chapter 17. John's Gospel, chapter 17. And here we have this very well-known and well-loved prayer of Jesus, our great high priest. John chapter 17, and we will read through verses 1 through to 7. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to. Nope. As many as you have given him. So that is a specific number and a specific people. So we then read, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And that theme continues down through to the end of uh, verse 8. And you see that that first part of the prayer relates to the life and the ministry and the work of Christ. But here's the important thought. Jesus is acknowledging that all those who will be his are those who have been given to him by the Father. Now this brings us back to the concept that salvation is of God. Let's uh, see how the Apostle Paul explains this. Go over into Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 28 through to 31. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You'll just note there that the purpose precedes the call. God doesn't call us in the gospel, and then the moment we are converted, decide what he will do with us, and where he'll fit us into his master plan. That's not how it works. God has a purpose for calling us. And so the call is to enable us to fulfill God's purpose. Now, let's read. A little more, for who he foreknew, he also predestined, and there's that word, to be conformed to the image of his Son. There's the purpose. So when God calls you to follow Jesus and to know him as your Savior, and he exercises saving grace in your heart and in your life, there is a reason for that work of grace, and it is that you may be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. That's the purpose. That takes us in, of course, to the whole work of sanctification and, and all of which Paul takes us through when we come over into chapter this chapter 8. But we read through in verse uh, 30, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And let me just underline the fact that that reference, uh, in a sense, is not related to our Christian freedom or liberty or even the power of our witness. That text in context is a reference to our salvation. If God determines our salvation, then nothing will prevent it from taking place. If God has set his love upon us, then nothing can separate us from his love. So here 
we have the connection, or if you like, the link. We have in John 17, Jesus acknowledging that all those who will come to him have been given to him by the Father. Now we have Paul reminding us in Romans chapter 8 that God is at work and nothing will disturb or defeat that purpose of his intention. Those whom he has predestined to become the children of God will at some point in their experience be brought into saving grace and faith. Now here is how it all comes together. Look at verse 33 of Romans 8. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. You see, the end of the day, it's God's work to bring salvation to the heart. Jesus came to make provision, to make it possible. The Holy Spirit applies the work of Calvary to the heart of the believing sinner. But it is God from whom salvation comes. He is the provider of our salvation. Remember over in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when heralding the birth of Jesus, she was told along with uh, Joseph that uh, when the child was born, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Who were or who are his people? John chapter 1, 11 and 12 tells us he came unto his own, but his own received him not. So is this reference telling us that all of the Jewish nation and descent will be saved? No. Jesus will save his people. Who are his people? His people are all those whom the Father has given him. They are his people. And so we come over now to John chapter 6. Let's go to John chapter 6. And in verse 44, we read, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You see, we can only become Christians. We can only become the beloved of God if the Father draws us. That's why you will find two people sitting together in church and one comes under conviction and the other one is bored out of their mind. It means nothing to them. Because God is not drawing them. God is not working in their heart. But you take someone and God is beginning to work his word into their heart and he's beginning to draw them to saving faith. And you will find that that person will want to know more. They'll want to learn more. They'll want to sit under the Word because they are being drawn by the Spirit of God. And so here we're told, the Father draws. Now let's go into Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And look at verse 39. Peter is preaching, and uh, he preaches with conviction. And there are many whose hearts are stirred. And as he comes to conclude his message, you will read these words in verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, and as many as the Lord our God will call. So here now we're told, one, the Father draws. Two, 
the Father calls. So we go back over into Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we read verse 6 again. And with this understanding we know that as Paul writes, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, the calling is the work of God. The drawing is the work of God. The predestination of our heart is the work of God. God is giving us to Jesus. So we, we have now that understanding in our mind. And we come to the second of these themes that is found in the first part of uh, verse 7. To all who are in Rome, be loved of God. So this now answers the question of our position. How do we find ourselves in the position where we are being drawn to Christ? We are hearing the call of God to our heart. Well, here is the first thought. We are beloved of God. The second thought is, of course, linked to that is called to be saints, which we'll look at in a moment. But let me just underline this because it becomes so important and essential to our understanding. When in verse 7, Paul writes, Beloved of God, called to be saints. This is not something that we are to aspire to. This is something that we already are. I don't have to strive or work towards being beloved of God. Nor do I need to struggle and try in the energy of my own self and of the flesh to live as a saint. I know, and you probably know too, that that would never happen if it was left up to me. And I have no doubt that you would say that of yourself as well. But that's our calling. We're called into this position. How do we know we're called? We know because we're assured that God loves us. And we're assured that God is working in us to fulfill his calling. Now this uh, little word, beloved, is a, an important word. There are several words that are translated in the Bible uh, as beloved. But there are these two identifying words that are the same. Paul uses the same word here that is used in the early chapters of Matthew's Gospel when, remember, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And recall how as he came up out of the water, a dove descended and sat upon him. And there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my, and there's the word, beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now that is the exact word that Paul uses here in verse 7 of Romans chapter 1. So what Paul is saying is, you have been called by God into relationship with Jesus Christ, and therefore you know that you are specially loved of God, beloved from the aspect of God's love toward us. And the encouragement of our heart is that we need to address the love of God the same way that Paul tells us we need to address our dying to self. Remember over in chapter 6, which we'll come to, he tells us there, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive 
unto righteousness. In other words, he is telling us, that's your position. You're dead to sin. Now, realize that. Understand that. Live as though you know what that means and how you appreciate that in your life. It's not something that you have to attain onto. It's something that is already done. That work of grace is already done. So here now, Paul is telling the believers in Rome, you need to get a handle on this. You need to understand this. You need to appreciate this. You are loved of God. So you need to be loved. In other words, submit to it, surrender to it, accept it, and know in your heart that even though your life may not be what you believe it ought to be, and you struggle in your faith, you struggle in your expression of your love for Jesus, yet nonetheless, you are beloved of God. And in the same way that uh, in Matthew chapter 3, God spoke of Jesus, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It'll be into the early part of chapter 8. We'll begin to develop that thought as uh, Paul explains to us our position as believers. We are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. That means that everything that Christ has uh, inherited by sovereign right, we inherit by faith. That's why God can say of us, they are beloved, just as he said of Jesus, beloved son. Now, if you want to expand that a little bit more, you could go over into 1 Peter chapter 2 and read verses 7 through to 10, or into Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 8. You'll see that referenced in your study notes. Uh, and there, they, they develop both in the Old Testament concept and the New Testament concept what God's people are. They're special. They're a treasure. They're a holy people. And they're that not because of anything that they have done, but because God has set his love upon them. You notice how John describes this relationship in 1 John 3 and verse 1. There he says, Behold. And the word behold there means focus on this, concentrate on this, take hold of this, hold this truth up, and let the sun shine upon it so that it sparkles in your eye and lay hold upon this truth. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. We could easily write in, Behold, what measure of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. But now for the third and final thought, here we have Paul in verse 7 of Romans chapter 1 confirming, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. I want you to do a little exercise. If you have your Bible there, uh, take a little look at that statement in the last part of verse 7, called to be saints. And uh, see if you can find if your eyesight is good, you may notice that the two little words, to be, are in italics. To be. What that means, and we've said this before, what that really means is that those two words were not actually found in the original. They have been placed there or positioned there to help us get an understanding of what the reference is relating to. But if we were to remove those two words, to be, we would have a better translation of what Paul is saying. 
And here it is. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called saints. That's the literal understanding of the text. That's their calling. That's their designation. So at Antioch, they got together and said, what do we call these strange people? And someone said, well, let's call them Christians because they're associated with, uh, with Christ. Previously, they were known as the people of the way. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So those that followed him were said to be of the way. But now they changed the term. They're known as Christians. So as far as the world is concerned, followers of Jesus are Christians. But in terms of heaven, what does God call us? He calls us saints. That's our position. That's the reality. We may not be terribly holy here and now, though we should be striving to be as holy as it's possible for saved sinners to be. But we may never make the grade in terms of holiness. And yet, because we're covered by the righteousness of Christ, when God looks upon us, he does not see our sin, our weakness, our frailty. He sees the finished work of Jesus. We're covered by his blood. We are recognized as being his. We are saints. And so, as Paul addresses himself, look up in verse 1, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called, and you'll see the two little words, to be or in italic, so we take them out. And what Paul is saying is, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called an apostle. Now, just let that little thought sink in for a moment. Paul was known as a blasphemer. Paul was known as a persecutor. Paul had many names by which he was known. But here Paul now says, a born servant of Jesus Christ called an apostle. Who's calling him an apostle? God is. That's the designation God has put upon him. He wasn't elected in the upper room to replace Judas. But he's an apostle because God has made him that. And now in verse 7, he continues. If in verse 1, Paul is an apostle, in verse 7, believers Christians are saints. There is no warrant or merit in Scripture for any church or denomination to isolate people and to turn them into saints. That's not a work we can do, not a work the church can do. We will not make any difference to their lives. And they will have no impact upon us when they're dead. The Bible doesn't isolate individuals. You will not find mention of a saint in the Bible. But we are all collectively, as the people of God, we are saints. And that is our position. That is our standing. Now, how does that relate to the church here in Rome? Well, just take your Bible and, and quickly look at Romans chapter 1 and come down to verse 28. We're going to be looking at this in more detail uh, shortly, but just have a little look at verse 28. Paul has been setting out some of the gross um, infidelity that has been taking place in Rome. It is a city on its way to moral ruin, uh, as well as all the other uh, that we're aware of, which we look at as we go through. But here is the conclusion that Paul uh, gives. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting 
been filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Imagine living in that environment. And so Paul is now saying to the believers, you may be living in that environment, but you are called saints. In other words, you must be different. Your lifestyle must be different. And all the way through, as Paul is building up these concepts, he is bringing us through to what will become the central feature of his letter. In verse 16 of chapter 1, look at verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. Note, not to everyone, but for everyone. See, the gospel doesn't only intervene in our lives and bring us savingly to Jesus, but the gospel establishes us in our walk with God. And so Paul tells us, it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. See, here Paul is describing the difference between trying to live as a Christian in the energy of the flesh and living as a Christian in the power of the gospel. See, that's why so many struggle, and they try to be good, and they build in this religious framework, and they try to establish themselves as followers of God, and they'll do all the ritual and the ceremony and all of that, and they'll believe in the saints, and they'll pray to the saints, and they'll honor the saints, and they'll do all of these things but it's to no avail. It takes the power of the gospel to break the bondage of sin and to cover us by the righteousness of Christ. And that's what Paul is bringing us to conclude. The word saint quite literally means uh, sanctified or set apart for a holy use. And you'll notice in your study notes that I've given you the, uh, the word uh, that is the root from which holy, holiness, and uh, all of that translates. And you see there that it's, uh, it's in the same school uh, or from the same root that that thought is implied. So when we're reading about holiness or sanctification as Paul takes us through in this letter. Chapter 6, for example, he talks about your fruit unto holiness uh, and in the end, everlasting life. Paul is drawing upon the fact that we are saints. God has put us in this position and now he wants to work in us and to produce in us the fruit of holiness. And uh, we will look at that, God willing, as we go through uh, these studies. But here is Paul's word to the believers who are in Rome. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. How did that happen? Well, God set us apart. God gave us to Jesus. God draws us as he calls us. He identifies his love in us, which is a love that is eternal. That means he loved us before we loved him. And in the fullness of that love, he has now drawn us to Christ and positioned us 
as his children, as his people. And he now continues to work in us that work of perfecting grace to enable us to become more and more like Jesus until the day he takes us from this life and brings us into the glory, perfected forever. And you and I need to grasp this. This is our experience. This is the enjoyment of the Christian life that God wants to establish in us. And when we get to the journey's end, we know that we will be taken into the presence of God joyfully and triumphantly, not because of how we have labored, but because of what God has done in us. We work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, but it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do, of his good pleasure. God is fulfilling his purpose in our lives. So we need to elevate our thoughts from this old sinful world and remember that we are the called of Jesus. We are loved of God. And we are saints. That is our position in the family of God. Yesterday afternoon, I had the privilege of uh, sitting by the bedside of a 98-year-old lady who is a child of God. And she is in the latter stages of uh, palliative care. And uh, for the first maybe 15 minutes, I had the joy of, of communicating with her, and she was responding very well. And, um, and then she got a little tired, and we had a little prayer. And when I started the prayer, she was with me. And when uh, I finished the prayer, I'm not sure where she was, but she, she, was, she had gone off into the land of Nod. But just sitting by her bed and quoting scriptures and talking over with her the things that God has laid in store for us. I, I was thinking in my own heart, what a privilege it is to be a child of God. And even to be able to sit there by the bed of one who has been a child of God for many years and to know that while they are leaving us here, they're going to be with Christ which is far better. And nothing in this life or world can compare or compete. And what a privilege it is to hear again this word of Paul, called of Jesus Christ, beloved of God, called saints. Are you there? Do you know that grace in your heart? Why not call upon the Lord for mercy today? Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for reminding us today of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes we fear that we take for granted the bounty of your blessings to us. But teach us to respect and reverence your word in our heart, knowing that you have made us what we are today by your grace. And as grace has led us safe thus far, grace will lead us home. Help us, Lord, to appropriate by faith these dimensions of your mercy to us so that we will be an example of righteousness to those who observe not only our witness, but our walk. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen. We're going to turn to the hymn book uh, for the closing hymn, number 182.